Oh, yeah. It's for being for you. So, we explain that we are like this opportunity we're like to have it. Yeah. 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 Are the parties present and ready to proceed? Defense is ready, Your Honor. As is the prosecution. All right, calling the case of United States v. Augie Shepard. Please make your appearances. Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon. My name is Ruby Scanlon. I'm joined today by my colleague, Megan Munts. Good afternoon, Your Honor. And together we represent the prosecution, the United States of America. Appearances from the defense, Your Honor? Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Ria Lakaraju, and I'm joined here today with my colleague, Ms. Sarah DeLacy. Good afternoon, Your Honor. And together we're going to be representing the defendant, Augie Shepard. All right, before we get to opening statements, are there any pretrial matters? Yes, Your Honor, just a few. First, we'd like to invoke Rule 603, the constructive swearing in of all witnesses, as well as Rule 615, the constructive sequestration of all witnesses. Any we objection? have no objection, Your Honor. All right, both are granted. Your Honor, I and the defense were able to meet and meet and confer just prior to today's trial. We also stipulated to the admissibility of Exhibit 25. Those are some jumper cables that you see on the table right there. All right. We also have a series of exhibits that we'd like to admit for the court. Their authenticity has been stipulated to, and I'll just read them now. We've also given defense notice of this and meet and confer. Those exhibits are three through six, 10 through 12, 15 through 17, that we'd like to move into evidence. Your Honor, we'd just like to make one note for the court. We'd just like to note that uh, 10 through 12 and 15 through 17 have satisfied federal rule of evidence 8036, so it's not hearsay for that reason. But Your Honor, we do object to the entering of those evidence, uh, those exhibits uh, under other grounds. So we have no problem with exhibits three through six being entered. We've stipulated the admissibility of those but we do object to the other exhibits uh, under stipulation 11 because they're not hearsay, but we may object under other grounds. But what are those grounds? Now we're gonna have to see how uh, the government plans to use them at trial, but before we do that, we don't want them to be entered prior to trial, but we'd like to reserve our right to object under grounds that are not hearsay, depending on how they choose to use the documents with their witness. Response? Yes, Your Honor, we believe that those exhibits can still be moved to evidence and if we use them in a manner that's problematic to the defense, it can be raised then, but we'd still like to offer them into evidence at this point in the trial. Response, Your Honor? Briefly. Yes, Your Honor, if they're in evidence, then the jury will be able to use them during their deliberations. That's exactly why we don't want them to be moved into evidence at this time. We have to see how the government plans on using those documents, what kind of testimony they plan on eliciting, whether uh, it's objectionable on other grounds that are not hearsay. We want to reserve the right to object in trial in case those ob in case there are objectionable uses of those documents. That means that the jury should not see it during their deliberations. Your objection is with respect to three through six. Uh, no, Your Honor. If I could direct your attention to page four in your bench book, the pretrial order. Sure. If you look at stipulation eleven, Miss Scanlon is referencing exhibits ten through twelve and fifteen through seventeen. Your Honor, we stipulated prior to trial that all of those exhibits have met the requirements of 803.6. 3 through 6, uh, if you look on the previous page, have been stipulated as, as admissible. However, 10 through 12 and 15 through 17, have only we've only agreed that those satisfy the requirements under 803.6, not that they are admissible as well. All right, I'm going to admit exhibits three through six, and I'll reserve ruling on exhibits 10 through 12 and 15 through 17 pending foundation. Yes, Your Honor. And with that, Your Honor, the prosecution has no further housekeeping matters. 
uh, we're ready to go with opening statements pending matters from the defense. We just have one housekeeping matter that we'd like to take care of, Your Honor. Since we've never had the pleasure of appearing in your courtroom, we'd just like to ask about your preferences. Uh, would you like us to ask permission before we approach the witness, the bench, and the jury, or just go ahead and approach freely? Uh, approach freely for opposing counsel and the witness. Please ask before approaching the jury. Yes, Your Honor, and with that, we're also ready for trial. All right, opening statements. Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, Ms. Lakaraju, members of the jury, the case, the car, the case. It's June 25th, 2021. A man named Barry Capello is sitting at his office desk at a business he owns, at an office just a few blocks away from you. For the first time in a while, Mr. Capello he feels safe. See, just three years ago, Mr. Capello was actually a part of the Philadelphia mob. That is until in 2018, he testified against the mob and entered witness protection. Now, got a new job, a new life, a new name. But all of a sudden, that's gone. Because when Mr. Capello looks out his office window on that June 25th afternoon, he sees Augie Shep, the defendant the head of the Philadelphia mob and the man that he had testified against. And within hours, Barry Capello is found dead. The case, the car, the case. That's why members of the jury, we've uh, convicted and charged Mr. Capello with two things, murder and retaliation against a witness. We'll have to meet that burden as the prosecution by beyond a reasonable doubt. To do that, we've got to do a couple of things. First, we have to prove that Augie Shepard intentionally killed Barry Capello. And second, we have to prove that he did so as retaliation against a witness for Mr. Capello's testimony. Now, the way we'll do that today is by asking you to focus again on those three things, the case, the car, and the cape. So let's start with that first one, the case. Because today, members of the jury, you're going to learn that Barry Capello testified in 2018 against the Philadelphia mob. But not just that, he testified under oath in court that Augie Shepard, the defendant, was involved in organized crime. He also testified that Augie Shepard's nephew had committed murder. That nephew was convicted of murder following Barry Capello's testimony. So I'm gonna ask you to focus on the call. Because today you're going to learn that Augie Shepard was visiting UCLA with his daughter when he rented a dark green sports car. You're going to learn that on the night of the murder, the person he was traveling with, his daughter, can't account for where the car or the defendant was right at that hour when the murder occurred. Instead, you're going to hear from an eyewitness to the attack that this eyewitness saw the killer fleeing the scene of the crime into a dark green sports car exact one that matches the description of the one Augie Shepard, the defendant, rented that weekend. Last members of the jury, we're going to ask you to focus on the jumper cables within that car. 
because you're going to learn that the rental company that Augie Shepard, the defendant, rented his car from, well, they include in every single rental a pair of jumper cables. Not just any jumper cables, members of the jury, you're going to learn that these were red and black nylite cables. Not the scene of the crime. Please find these red and black nylite cables and find that they are the murder weapon that was used to strangle Barry Capello in the driveway of his home. We'll further learn that these nylite cables that were in that rental car, well, after Augie Shepard rented that car, they went missing. The case, the car, the cables. Members of the jury, throughout today's trial, we're going to ask you to remember those three things. So at today, at the end of today's trial, I'm going to come before you and ask you to find the only victim, the verdict that justice demands. I'm going to ask you to find Augie Shepard guilty. Thank you. Open and go to defense, Your Honor. Go ahead. May I proceed? You may. Your Honor, Ms. Scanlon, members of the jury. When Ms. Scanlon just got up here, she told you a lot about June 26 of 2021. She told you that on that day, a man named Barry Capello was murdered. Members of the jury, she told you about a moment. The moment that Mr. Capello looked out his office window and saw Mr. Shepard. She told you that within hours of that moment, Mr. Capello was dead. See, members of the jury, you're going to learn today that when Ms. Scanlon told you about the government story, about their case, there's some things that she left out. You're going to hear that the government, they cut some corners. Let's talk about what Ms. Scanlon didn't tell you, about what you won't hear. Because members of the jury today, you won't hear that the government has any forensic evidence linking Mr. Shepard to this crime. You won't hear Ms. Scanlon show you any camera footage, any DNA tests, any forensic tests taken on Mr. Shepard? In fact, members of the jury, what you will hear today is that the government's timeline of this whole case, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. What you will hear is that the government focused their investigation on one person, Mr. Shepard. <coughs> what you will hear is that the government, the police, they cut corners to make their case. And that's a problem for the government today. See, members of the jury, it's interesting that when Ms. Scanlon came up here, she said that the government, they charged and convicted Mr. Shepard already. Members of the jury, they haven't convicted Mr. Shepard of anything. That's why we're in court today. Today, they have charged Mr. Shepard with two very serious crimes murder and eyewitness retaliation. Members of the jury, that means that before the government convicts Mr. Shepard, they have to prove two things to you. They have to prove to you that Mr. Shepard killed Barry Capello. And they have to prove that he killed Mr. Capello because Mr. Capello testified in a trial all the way back in 2018. Members of the jury, before they convict anybody, they have to prove those two things to you beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the highest burden in our legal system. Members of the jury, it's a burden the government won't be able to meet. Because if at the end of this trial, you have any lingering questions, you think that there's some facts that the state missed, you think that they cut corners to make their case, then you cannot find Mr. Shepard 
guilty. And we're confident that you won't. But to help you see that, there's three very simple questions that I want you to think about today. First, why is the government really accusing Mr. Shep? Second, how much evidence do they actually have? And third, does their story really make any sense? So members of the jury, let's go ahead and take those one at a time. First, why is the government accusing Mr. Shepard? Because members of the jury today, you're going to heal about a trial that Barry Capello testified in all the way back in 2018. You're going to hear that during that trial, Mr. Capello labeled Mr. Shepard as a mob leader in open court. And you're going to hear that after the police, after the government heard that, they labeled Mr. Shepard as a suspect before they actually found any evidence linking him to the crime. And second, you're not going to hear about any forensic evidence today that actually places Mr. Shepard at the scene of the murder. Ms. Scanlon, she's not going to show you any DNA tests, no skin cell tests, no hair follicle tests, no fingerprint tests, nothing that actually places Mr. Shepard at Mr. Capello's residence at the time of the murder. And third, members of the jury today, you're going to find that the government's case, the story they're trying to sell you, it doesn't really make any sense. Because how exactly did Mr. Shepard know where Mr. Capello lived in the first place? How was Mr. Shepard so sure that he wouldn't get caught? And why is there GPS data placing Mr. Shepard miles away from the crime scene at the time of the murder? Members of the jury, these are all questions that the government will not be able to answer today. Now, I know that this trial is going to be difficult to listen to. I know that you must want answers for Mr. Capello's death. Members of the jury, I want those answers too. But as difficult as it may be, it's important to remember why we're all really here today. Because it isn't to blame. It isn't to point fingers. It isn't to cut corners. It's to find the truth. Members of the jury, you'll learn that the truth in this case is that the government, the police, they cut corners to make their case. That's why at the end of this trial, I'm going to come up here again and ask you to find Mr. Shepard not guilty. Thank you. Prosecution, are you ready to call your first witness? Yes, Your Honor, we are. Prosecution calls Marshal Connor Wright. May I proceed? You may. Good afternoon, Agent. Can you please introduce yourself to the members of the jury? Good afternoon. My name is Marshal Connor Wright. What do you do for a living? I'm a Deputy Marshal. I work for United States Marshal Services. How long have you been working in that capacity? I've been working there since 2008. Do you have any education? Certainly. In 2007, I earned my degree in criminal justice from, you know, from U.S., uh, excuse me, UC Santa Barbara. Marshall, do you have any specialized training? Certainly. The next year after I graduated, I completed a 19-week training course in Georgia on the federal law enforcement. Um, I also have training in court proceedings, criminal investigations, and much more. And I want to move on and talk about today's case. How were you involved? Well, I was the officer that coordinated the uh, disappearance of Barry Capello. Do you know Barry Capello? Certainly. Um, I've known Mr. Capello since 2008. How'd you know him? Well, in 2000, uh, excuse me, 2018, Mr. Capello gave testimony uh, that compromised his uh, safety. So it was my job to relocate him after giving that testimony. 
Do you know the defendant, Augie Shepard? I do. Uh, Mr. Shepard was one of the people that Mr. Capello testified against in 2018. Do you know what the result of that case? Yes. Um, after Mr. Capello gave that testimony, the person he was testifying against did end up going to jail. And who was he testifying against? Mr. Shepard's nephew. Then I want to move on and talk about June 25th, 2021. Ma'am, do you know where the defendant was that day? Yes, he was in L.A. How do you know that? Well, because his uh, daughter, or son, excuse me, was touring UCLA. Um, he was on a string of college tours. Um, his cell phone data also puts him in uh, L.A. And do you have any of them? That the defendant saw Barry Capello that day? Yes. Um, at 12.50, I received a call from Mr. Capello saying that he saw the defendant. Would you recognize the voicemail of that call if you heard it? I would. Ms. Muntz, if you would. Call you and get this. I, I think they found it. Mark Shepard just walked by my office window and made eye contact. Marshall, whose voice was that? Barry Capello. Objection, Your Honor, at this time to hearsay. May I be heard? Yes. Your Honor, first, Your Honor, we'd like to establish for the record that the recording that Ms. Munz just played is Exhibit 13. And we also have a transcript of that recording, which is Exhibit 14. And Your Honor, we have objections to both the audio recording and the transcript being entered as they're both hearsay. Response? Yes, Your Honor, I haven't entered the exhibit yet. We're just getting some foundation for it right now. So I think this objection's untimely, but we can also hash it out right now. Response? Well, we just listened to this voicemail, which is an out-of-court statement. So how do you respond to hearsay? Certainly, Your Honor. This falls under an exception to the rule against hearsay. Exception 8031, present sense impression. This voice voicemail was recorded right after Barry Capello saw his former mob boss. He was eliciting that statement just after seeing him. So it falls under that present sense impression exception. Response? Your Honor, we don't have any foundation on the record that that voicemail was actually left right after this interaction occurred. All we know is that this voicemail was sent to this witness. We have no idea what time that actually happened. May I respond? You may. Your Honor, opposing counsel's objection goes to the weight non-admissibility. He said in that voicemail that he just saw Algie Shepard outside his window send that voicemail. Response? Your Honor, in order for Ms. Scanlon to admit this evidence under 8031, she must establish prior to its admittance that this was made immediately, that this statement was made immediately after the interaction for it to qualify as a present sense impression. The foundation is a prerequisite for her to be able to use this evidence, and we don't have that foundation on the record in any capacity. Can you lay the foundation? Yes, Your Honor, and if I could read that transcript just one more time. Yes. Yes, Your Honor, it says, call me when you get this. Augie Shepard just walked by my office window. We believe that's sufficient foundation, but we can also ask more questions if you'd like. Please lay the foundation. Yes, Your Honor. Marshall, when did you receive that voicemail? 12.50 p.m. on June 25th, 2021. And did you see any receipts of the defendants? I did. Which receipts were those? A uh, receipt for lunch at the Pomodoro and a receipt for ice cream at Saffron and Rose. And do you know what business is between Saffron and Rose and Pomodoro? Klein Travel. And who owns Klein Travel? Tom Klein, or Barry Capella. Would you recognize a receipt that you saw, the receipt from lunch of Augie Shepard? Certainly. Your Honor, I'm approaching opposing counsel with what has been marked as Exhibit 15. Permission to approach the witness with the same? Marshall, what did I just hand you? You handed me a receipt for the Pomodoro. And what's the timestamp on that receipt? 12.47 p.m. Do you have any reason to believe that Augie Shepard did anything between leaving Pomodoro and walking past Klein Travel? No, I don't. So what time did you see uh, that voicemail, or receive that voicemail uh, from Barry Capel? 12.50 p.m., three minutes after this receipt. Thank you, I can take that. Your Honor, I'd like to re-raise my objection to hearsay. May I be heard? Briefly. 
Yes, Your Honor, we don't believe that enough foundation has been laid to establish that this voicemail was left immediately after this interaction occurred. All we know, all the foundation that we have on the record right now is that these stores were next to each other. We have foundation on the record that he visited stores nearby. That doesn't necessarily mean that he was in the exact proximity of the store in the middle. We don't even know how far apart these stores were, Your Honor, because of that, the requisite foundation has not been laid. May I respond, Your Honor? Briefly. This witness has relayed sufficient foundation. She said that there's three stores, Commodoro, which we just showed the receipt of, another store, and Klein Trap. You know that those stores are right next to each other? And this voicemail was sent just three minutes after Augie Shepard received that receipt. It's in a sufficiently small amount of time to meet that 8031 exception. We believe we found this, laid the foundation for 8031. Response? The objection's overruled. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, Marshall. I can take that back from here. Your Honor, the prosecution offers Exhibit 13, that audio file, into evidence. It's admitted. Yes, Your Honor. I want to talk about what happened to Barry Capello later that night. Okay. And do you know how he died? Yes. Uh, records from the autopsy show that he died from strangulation. Do you know with what? A pair of jumper cables. Uh, I found them next to his body when I saw them next day. Do you know what time he died? Autopsy report says that uh, he died between 12 a.m. and 1 a.m. on June 26, 2021. Marshall, does the defendant have an alibi for that time period you just gave us? No, uh, there's no one that can account for the defendant's records, uh, excuse me. Uh, Objection, Your Honor, lack of personal knowledge, may I be heard? Yes. Your Honor, I'm objecting specifically to the witness's statement, there is no one who can account for the defendant's whereabouts. Uh, we have no foundation on the record for how she knows that or how she would be able to lay foundation for that opinion. We need to hear more foundation before she can testify to that. Sustained. Yes, Your Honor. Marshall, in the course of your investigation, what uh, witnesses did you interview? I interviewed uh, every witness that I could. Uh, I've interviewed Mr. Um, Klein's neighbor. I interviewed Mr. Marsh uh, Mr. Shepard's uh, son. I interviewed uh, every witness that had anything that could, get, that could be helpful for today's case. And were any of those witnesses able to give you the whereabouts of the defendant between midnight and 1 a.m.? No, ma'am. Specifically, I interviewed Mr. Shepard's son, and uh, Mr. Shepard's son was gone from 11.30 p.m. to 3 a.m. on the June 25th and June 26th. And I want to take us back, Marshall, to those jumper cables you mentioned earlier. Okay. Would you recognize those jumper cables if I showed them to you? Yes, ma'am, I would. Honor, I'm approaching the witness with what has been marked as Exhibit 28. It's already been entered. Marshall, what did I just hand you? You handed me the jumper cables that I found next to Mr. Klein's body. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Sure. Uh, these are red and black nylite uh, jumper cables. Uh, like I said, I found them next to Mr. Klein's, bo Mr. Klein's body. Um, and uh, in my investigation, I also saw some connection between these jumper cables and Mr. Shepard. All right. Do you know if Mr. Shepard had access to cables like those? Certainly. Uh, for his trip to UCLA, Mr. Shepard rented a car, um, and that car was a co was a pair of nylite cables just like these. And uh, objection, Your Honor, lack of foundation. May I be heard? Yeah. You know, we need to hear how the witness knows that these jumper cables came with this specific car. She's named already. This is a very specific brand. We need more information on the record as to how exactly she found out this information before she can testify that he did in fact have access to those specific cables. We can lay that foundation, Your Honor. Please do. Marshall, did you talk to the rental car company? I did. I received a letter from them. What did they tell you about jumper cables and those rental cars? They told me that in every single uh, rental car that they give out, they put a pair of nylite jumper cables in the cars. And after Augie Shepard returned the car he rented to the company, did they find those cables in them? No, ma'am. Uh, they were missing. Thank you. I can take those back. Marshall, was there a witness to this attack? Yes, ma'am, there was. Uh, what did they see? Well, uh, the, this witness was Mr. Klein's neighbor across the street, Bellamy Dembski, and he remembered seeing a uh, attacker and a car. 
And I want to start with the car. <clears throat> what type of car did Mr. Bellamy report see? He remembered seeing a dark colored sports car, maybe a Ferrari. And I want to talk about the attack. What was the witness's description of the attack? Mr. Dembski said that the attacker was 5'10 and about 180 pounds. Did you recall anything else about that attack? He remembered that he might have been a white male um, and that he had dark hair. And also that he had a uh, car that he was driving in, a dark colored sports car. Marshall, did those descriptions match the description of the defendant? Certainly. Mr. Shepard is a 5'10", 5'11", male, and he's 180 pounds. Thank you, Marshall. Your Honor, I have nothing further. Cross your Go ahead. How are you, ma'am? I'm well, ma'am. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. I'm just going to ask you some questions, and we'll get you on your way, okay? Okay. And I want to start by talking about your investigation in this case, okay? Okay. Now, you'd agree with me that you believe the night of the murder, Mr. Shepard left his hotel, right? Right. Drove to Mr. Capello's house. That's correct. And then you think that he strangled Mr. Capello with some jumper cables, right? Right. That's what the autopsy showed. Now, ma'am, a couple moments ago, you said something really interesting on your direct examination. You said that you didn't find any alibi for Mr. Shepard that night, right? That's correct. You said that no one you interviewed can testify to Mr. Shepard's whereabouts, right? That's correct. Ma'am, I want to talk about something that can give us some more information about Mr. Shepard's whereabouts. You'd agree that you looked at his phone, right? That's right. When you looked at his phone, you found GPS data. That's right. Ma'am, you'd agree with me that GPS data can be pretty useful in cases like this, correct? Certainly. We use it in this case for sure. GPS data can tell you a whole lot about someone's whereabouts, true? They can tell you about the phone's whereabouts, not always about the person, but sure. That's right, ma'am. I can tell you about where that phone is. That's right. You'd agree that when you looked at GPS data in this case, you found out that Mr. Shepard was at his hotel the night of the murder. True? I found out that his phone was at the night of the murder, yes. Ma'am, when you looked at that GPS data, you found out Mr. Shepard's phone was at his hotel from 10 p.m. on June 25th that's right. 5 a.m. on June 26th. Is that true? Yes, ma'am. That's where his phone was. Ma'am, you'd agree with me, his hotel. That's not Mr. Capello's house, right? Certainly not, <clears throat> no. And ma'am, I want to talk about something else you mentioned under examination. You told us a whole lot about those jumper cables. Let's focus on that for a minute, okay? Okay. You believe that those were the murder weapon in this case, right? Yes, that's what the autopsies consisted of. Now, ma'am, you'd agree with me that when Mr. Shepard went to Mr. Capello's house with those jumper cables, he had to travel to that house, right? Right. Uh, it's our belief that he drove his Ferrari to Mr. Klein's house. All right, ma'am. It's your belief that he drove all the way there. Right. And you'd agree with me that to drive all the way there, you'd have to know where you're going, right? That's exactly right, ma'am. You'd have to know where that person lives. That's right. Let's talk about whether or not that makes sense in this case. Ma'am, you'd agree with me. Mr. Capello was in witness protection, correct? That's right. I was one of the people that helped relocate Ma'am, you were the one that put him in witness protection, isn't that true? That's absolutely correct. You were in charge of his relocation, right? Yes, ma'am. You'd agree with me that it was your job to make sure that his location was confidential. That's right. We did the best we can. Ma'am, you made sure his location was not public. Yes. Means you made sure he couldn't be found on the internet. That's right. Couldn't be found in yellow pages. That's right. Ma'am, you'd agree with me. You have no idea how Mr. Shepard knew where Mr. Capello lived. Isn't that true? That's right. You'd have to ask Mr. Shepard. So you don't know? I don't know. All right, ma'am, then let's talk about what happened that night, at least your explanation of it. You'd agree with me that you think these jumper cables were used to strangle Mr. Capello to death. Isn't that true? That's correct. Ma'am, I want to be clear about exactly how you think this attack happened, okay? Okay. Your Honor, would it be all right if Ms. DeLacy stepped into the well for a brief demonstration? Yes. I mean, I just want to make sure that I have the positioning of this attack exactly correct, okay? Okay. You'd agree with me that you believe the attacker was behind Mr. Capello, right? That's what Mr. Dembski observed, yes. Mr. Lacey, could you stand behind me for a moment? 
and you believe that the attacker pulled this this uh, jumper cable around Mr. Capello's neck, true? That's right. Your Honor, with the court's permission, would it be all right if Ms. DeLacy held this around my neck for a moment? We promise she's not going to pull too hard. As long as she's not pulling too hard. Yes, yes Your Honor, we'll make sure. Now, <laughs> ma'am, let's just walk through how this attack might have happened, okay? Okay. You'd agree with me that the assailant was pulling this cord pretty tight, right? Yes, tight enough to go. That's right, man. When someone's being strangled, they pull cords like this pretty hard. Right. You'd agree with me. If someone's being strangled to death, they're probably going to try to fight back, right? It depends on the person, but sure. Well, ma'am, they're not going to let themselves be strangled to death, right? I guess not, no. They might try to pull at this cable around their neck. That's right. They might try to hit their assailant on the head. That's right, ma'am. You can see I'm standing pretty close to Miss DeLacy right now, right? Yes. They might try to pull at their assailant's hair. Right. You'd agree that this struggle, it was a pretty violent one, right? That's what the evidence shows, yes. You found evidence that the victim was clawing at his neck. Yes. Mr. Lace, you can take your seat. Ma'am, to be clear in this case, you didn't find any bruises on Mr. Shepard's body, right? Uh, Mr. Shepard's son didn't recall seeing any bruises, no. So that's a no? That's, yes, ma'am. No scratches on his body? No. No visible injuries of any kind, true? No, it's my understanding that Mr. Uh, Shepard was pretty covered when he committed this assault. So ma'am, you did not find a single visible injury on his person, true? No ma'am, he covered his tracks. That's a no? No ma'am, yeah. In fact ma'am, you'd agree with me. You actually didn't find a single trace of forensic evidence at the crime scene that linked back to Mr. Shepard, right? I wouldn't agree with that. You didn't find any fingerprints no, of Mr. Shepard? You didn't find any hair follicles? No, like I said, he covered his tracks. So ma'am, that's a no? Yes ma'am. You didn't find any skin cells? No. You didn't even find any DNA, did you? I did not. Ma'am, you didn't find a single trace of Mr. Shepard being at the crime scene at all? No. Nothing further, Your Honor. Redirect, Your Honor? Yes. <coughs> may I proceed? You may. Marshal, Ms. Walker, I you just asked you about forensic evidence. Yes, she did. Did you find any evidence that the attacker was wearing gloves during the assailment? I did. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Right. Mr. Dembski recalls seeing Mr. Uh, the defendant with gloves on his hands when he committed his attack. Thank you, Marshal. Your Honor, I have nothing further. And barring any recross, we just ask that the Marshal be excused. Any recross? Just briefly, Your Honor. All right. Ma'am, you just mentioned gloves on the defendant's hands. Did you find any evidence that the defendant was wearing a hat? during this assault? No, no one recalled seeing a hat. Did Mr. Dembski say anything about long sleeves? No, ma'am. What about long pants? No, ma'am. Nothing further, Your Honor. Your Honor, may the marshal now be excused. Yes. Thank you. Your Honor, at this time, we'd like to open our case in chief. And the defense calls Ms. Lor Mr. Lauren Shepard. All right. May I proceed? You may. Sir, could you please introduce yourself to the members of the jury? Hi, uh, I'm Lauren Shepard. So my friends call me Lou. How old are you, Lou? Uh, I'm 18. And do you go to school? Uh, yeah, actually, um, I just got to Berkeley, so I'll be going in the fall. How do you like it, Joe? Uh, well, the tour was amazing, um, so I'm really excited. Sir, do you know exactly why you're testifying here in court today? Yeah, um, my, uh, my Uncle Barry is gone, and, and then they're saying my dad did it. Um, so I'm going to tell you that that's not true. Sir, I know it might be a little bit difficult to talk about this case today, so if you need a moment at any point, just go ahead and let me know, all right? Okay. You just mentioned your Uncle Barry a couple moments ago. Can you tell us exactly who that person is? Uh, yeah, uh, his name was Barry Capello, um, and he was kind of my role model growing up. How long have you known him? My whole life. And what was your relationship like with Mr. Capella? Uh, we were really close. Uh, like I said, I called him Uncle Barry. He wasn't actually my uncle, though. Sir, do you think that you'd be able to recognize a photo of your uncle, or who you say is your uncle? We called your uncle. <laughs> if I showed one to you now? Uh, of course, yeah. Sir, could you pick up that binder on the floor there? 
and flip to the page labeled Exhibit 18. And let me know when you're there. Sir, do you recognize that photo? Uh, yeah, this is, uh, I think, Thanksgiving a couple years ago. And can you just describe what's in that photo for the members of the jury? Uh, yeah, so um, there's some family friends. Uh, but this is my dad, uh, Mrs. Uncle Barry. Sir, does that photo look like it's been changed since you last saw it? No, it looks the same. Your Honor, defense moves to enter exhibit 18. Without objection. It's admitted. Sir, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about your relationship with your dad, okay? Who exactly is he? Uh, well, my dad's name is Augie Shepard, um, and he owns a waste management company in Philadelphia. Can you tell us a little bit more about what your relationship is like with your dad? Yeah, um, you know, my dad's really busy, um, but I've always looked up to him, and he's always been great to me. Sir, did you ever go on trips with your dad during your time with him? Yeah, all the time. Um, actually, our most recent trip was here uh, in the area of L.A. I want to focus on that trip to L.A. just a little bit more, okay? When exactly did that happen? Uh, well, that was in summer of last year, um, so we came in in June 25th, uh, 2021. Were you there on June 26th as well? Yeah, we, we flew out that morning. And what exactly did you do on that trip to L.A.? Uh, well, we were touring UCLA. Um, we had actually been touring a couple other colleges, including Berkeley, um, the week before. And I want to walk through that trip just a little bit more in detail, okay? Okay. When exactly did you first get to LA? Uh, we, uh, we drove in in the morning um, and got in around noon. And then what did you do when you got there? Well, we had a, a noon reservation for lunch at this Italian place. And then what did you do after you went to that Italian place? Uh, after that, we, uh, we got some ice cream, um, and then we took a tour of campus. Did you do anything after you took that tour of campus? Yeah, we, um, we went back to the hotel and stayed there for a bit, and then we got dinner. All right, so, so between getting ice cream and taking the tour of campus and everything else you did in between, was your father with you that whole time? Uh, yeah, you know, he, he would never let me out of the site. At any point, did he leave you to go somewhere else? No, he was, he was kind of walking us around the whole time. Sir. At any point, did you see him speaking to anyone else? Well, uh, some admissions commission officers, um, but that was it. Well, sir, that photo that you just looked at a couple moments ago, Barry Capello, did you see him speaking with anyone who looked like that? No. Did he ever mention Barry Capello's name to you at any point that day? No. Well, we hadn't seen Uncle Barry in years. Did he appear nervous or out of the ordinary to you, at least from what you could tell? Uh, everything seems totally normal. All right, sir, so what did you do after you went to dinner that day? Uh, well, after dinner, uh, we came back and then got ready for bed. And then what time would you say you went to sleep? Uh, well, actually, I didn't that night. Um, I went out to go to a college party later. All right, sir, well, what time did you get back to the hotel? Uh, from dinner. That's right, sir. Um, at around 10.30. All right, I want to focus on what happened from 10.30 to the rest of the night, okay? You just said a couple moments ago that you left at some point that night. When was that? Uh, around 11.30, uh, my friend Jackie invited me out to a party. And what exactly did you do between that time? Uh, well, I, um, I Ubered over to the party. Um, I was there for a couple hours, and then I came back. Sir, before you left for that party, was your dad still at the hotel? Yeah. Did he appear out of the ordinary or strange to you in any way from what you could tell? No, he was just sleeping. And what time did you get back to the hotel? Uh, around 3 a.m. All right, sir, so after 3 a.m., was your dad still at the hotel? Yeah, he was still sleeping in bed. That entire time period that you were gone, did your dad contact you at all? No, he didn't know I was gone. Did he text you? Objection, Your Honor, to speculation, specifically to the phrasing, he didn't know I was gone. Sustained. Yes, Your Honor, and moved to strike. It's stricken. Sir, did your dad text you or call you at any point while you were away from the hotel? Uh, no, he didn't. Did he contact you with any other form of communication? No. And sir, when you got back to the hotel, was your dad still there? Yeah, he was still sleeping. Did objection, he, Your Honor, to speculation as to the phrasing, he was still sleeping? Your Honor, if I may be heard? Yes. This implies that he was sleeping from 11.30 when this witness left to when he got back at 3 a.m. We just have him revise his language a little bit. Response, Your Honor? Your Honor, this witness testified to what was rationally based on his own perception. When he left the hotel, his dad was sleeping, 
When he got back to the hotel, his dad was still sleeping, at least as it appeared to this witness. If Ms. Scanlon takes issue with his language, she can cross-examine on those discrepancies. Overruled. Yes, Your Honor. Sir, could you just tell the members of the jury one more time, when you got back to the hotel, what did your dad look like? Uh, he was just still sleeping. He was just in his bed. Now, Your Honor, at this time we'd like to read uh, a portion of Exhibit 18 onto the record. Excuse me, Your Honor, not Exhibit 18, eight, uh, Exhibit 4. And we'd just like to know that this is one of the exhibits that has been stipulated admissible by both parties. All right. And we'd just like the court to note that we will be reading aloud from page 29 in your bench book, Your Honor. Lines 8 and 9, and also lines 14 and 15. The title reads, Cellular Evidence, Obtained Warrant for Augie Shepard's iPhone 12, the phone, and all data associated with phone. Location data places the phone at UCLA Guest House from 2215 hours on June 25th to 0500 hours on June 26th. Sir, I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk about what happened that next morning. What time did you wake up when you got back to the hotel? Uh, around 5 a.m. We, we had a really early flight that day. Was your dad still there? Yeah. At around 5 a.m. when you woke up that day, would you say that you got a good look at your dad? Yeah, I guess. I mean, we were in the same hotel room. So I'm going to ask you a couple questions that might sound a little bit strange, but can you tell me if your dad had any bruises on his face or his body from what you could see? Uh, no, he looks normal. Any scratches on his body? Not that I could see. Were you able to see any visible injuries at all? No, he looks completely fine. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, we have no further questions at this time. Cross-examination. Go ahead. May I proceed? You may. Mr. Shepard, you've lied about this case to protect your fault, haven't you? No, absolutely not. Well, sir, you were interviewed by the FBI about this case. Uh, yeah, someone, some agent talked to me. This agent asked you about your whereabouts on June 25th of 2021. Yeah. Initially, you told them that you and your father got back to the hotel at 10.30, right? Yeah. I told that agent that you stayed there the entire night. Yeah, look, my dad just told me never ever to go to beer parties, is what he called him. And I, I know I made a mistake, but I didn't want him to find out that I had snuck out that night. So that's a yes to my question. You told the FBI authorities that you and your father stayed in the entire night. Yes or no? Yeah. Sir, that was a lie. Yeah, I, like I said, I went out that night. Exactly. Truth is, you left at 11.30 p.m. Yep. Then those agents asked you when you got back. Yeah. Told those agents you got back at 12.30. Yeah. Sir, that was a lie. Yeah, you know, I knew I just wasn't supposed to be there. I was 17, and then there was alcohol at that party, so I, I wouldn't want to get in trouble. So I want to talk about what the truth is. The truth is, you were gone from 11.30 to 3 a.m. on that night. Yeah, but, but I promise, I, I didn't drink anything. <laughs> Sir, that's okay, you're not on trial today. But you were gone from 11.30 to 3 a.m., isn't that true? Yeah, that, that sounds right. It's roughly three and a half hours you were away from your father? Yeah. Sir, that's three and a half hours that you don't know what your dad was doing. Uh, no, I guess not. Those three and a half hours he could have left the hotel in your rental car? I, I don't know what he did. To me, it looked like he was sleeping when I got back. You don't know what he did in those three and a half hours that you were away. Right, I, I wasn't there. Then, Mr. Shepard, let's talk about some things that we can agree Because you would agree with me that your dad is roughly 5'10", 5'11". Yeah. You'd agree he's roughly 180, 190 pounds? Probably. He's pretty touchy about it. <laughs> Ms. Munz, could you read from line 40 of the FBI report? So the attacker was male, about 5'11", and 180 pounds. Also agree with me that when you went to California, you rented a dark green sports car. Uh, yeah, it was a Ferrari. Um, you know, my dad knows I love those cars. Ms. Muntz, if you could read from Mr. Dembski, the neighbor eyewitnesses recount from line 20. In the early morning of June 26th, around 12.30 a.m., cupboards started barking. 
I got out of bed and went to my front window. I saw an expensive sports car parked across the street. Line 24. It was definitely a dark color. The sports car was parked halfway between two streetlights, each about 25 feet away. I had not seen it earlier that night, and it didn't belong to any of my neighbors. Thank you, Ms. Vaughn. Mr. Shepard, I want to talk about the victim in this case, Barry Capella. Sir, you know Barry Capella. Yeah, like I said, my whole life. You told Ms. LaGaraji that you considered him an uncle. Yeah, we called him Uncle Barry. That changed in 2017, didn't it? No. Sir, in 2017, Uncle Barry, well, he testified against your family. Yeah, you know, I, he made a mistake. I don't want to hate him. I want to talk about how your father feels about him. Because your father told you that Uncle Barry, well, he testified that your father was involved in organized crime. Yeah, I, I know that's not true, but he said that because he wanted to get out of some drug crime. Sir, I'm not asking you to speculate as to why he said what he said. I'm asking you what he said. Yeah, that's what my dad said. Your dad also told you that he accused your nephew of murder. Uh, my cousin, yeah. You know that your cousin went to jail following that trial? Yeah, and I want to be clear, that didn't happen, but that's what, that's what people were saying. Your father was furious with Barry Capella. Dad was pretty mad, yeah. Your father called him a rat. That's what he said. He said he was dead to this fan. Yeah, you know, my dad didn't want to see him again or talk to him. So he asked my question, your father said, Barry Capello is dead to this fan. Yeah, that's what he said. Ms. Muntz, if you could read from line 30 of the FBI report. Barry Capello's government cooperation is a mob offense punishable by death. Thank you, Ms. Muntz, and thank you, Mr. Shepard. Your Honor, I have no further questions. Redirect. Uh, Your Honor, we'd just like to ask uh, how much time we have left for direct. You have um, two minutes and... You have a minute for you. We'll do a brief redirect, Your Honor. Sir, I just have a couple more questions for you and then we'll get you out of here again, okay? Okay. All right, sir, I just want to be clear. Have you ever been to Santa Monica or L.A. before your trip with your dad? No. Sir, would you say that Santa Monica was a relatively nice area or was it a more, uh, you know, average area from what you could see? Objection, Your Honor, calls for speculation. We know that he went to UCLA, the Westwood area. We don't know if he went to Santa Monica, and it's improper to ask him to speculate as to the wealth of the neighborhood. Response, Your Honor? Yes. The question was from what he could see. If he can't form that, it's his own opinion, excuse me, Your Honor. He can testify to what he saw personally. Overruled. Yes, Your Honor, if I could change my objection. To lack of foundation, we haven't heard any foundation that this witness actually went to Santa Monica at any point. Can you lay that foundation? I can lay that foundation, Your Honor. Sustained. Sir, did you ever travel around the Santa Monica area? Uh, well, I'm not great at geography, but we were definitely, you know, exploring the city a lot. Would you say that you saw any nice cars in that area? Yeah, well, I mean, how many dealerships have Ferrari rentals? Objection, Your Honor, again, to lack of foundation. This witness only said that he was exploring the city a lot, not that he actually went to Santa Monica. Response, Your Honor? Yes. Your Honor, the witness testified that he was in the general vicinity. We already have that on the record. Ms. Scanlon wants to question his geographic knowledge, and she can do that with the recross. May I respond? You may. Your Honor, getting this point is very important. There's a lot of neighborhoods across California. We know he was in Westwood, but actually attesting to the wealth and niceness of the neighborhood that Mr. Capello was murdered in, that's <coughs> very probative, and we need to hear if he actually went to that neighborhood or not. Uh, please lay some more foundation. Yes, Your Honor. Sir, do you remember seeing any signs while you were traveling around that said you were in an area called Santa Monica? Uh, probably, yeah. And sir, can you describe the level of wealth you saw in those areas? Uh, well, like I said, you know, we, we rented a Ferrari from this dealership. You know, we could have done that in Pennsylvania. Did you see any cars that looked like yours? Uh, yeah, I think we must have, right? Sir, Ms. Scanlon also asked you a lot of questions about uh, the height of your dad. Would you say that 5'11 is a particularly tall height? No, you know, Dad actually used to tell me he was six feet tall. He's pretty touchy about that. Sir, do you know anyone else who's 5'11? Yeah, I'm 5'11. Sir, would you say that 
size 11 shoes. Would you say that those are common or uncommon? I don't really know. That sounds pretty normal. Do you know anyone else with size 11 shoes? Uh, yeah, I'm sure. That's all, Your Honor. We just asked the witness to be excused barring any recross. Any recross? No recross, Your Honor. Witness is excused. Before we go into closing arguments, I'd like to check in with the jury to see if anyone would like a bathroom break. All right. Prosecution, please give your closing argument. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Walker Audrey, members of the jury, the case, the car, the case. I want to start this by talking about what we agree. Because both the prosecution and the defense, we agree that Barry Capello was victim to a murder. A tragedy that never should have taken place. The defense and the prosecution, we agree on what exactly happened that night, how he was murdered, but today we're asking you to decide on who that murderer was. And today we've showed you exactly what happened. Through the case, we heard that Barry Capello testified against the defendant's family sent the defendant's nephew to prison, testified under oath that the defendant was involved in organized crime, and not that just he was involved. The victim of this murder testified that the defendant was the head of the Philadelphia mob. You heard on the cross-examination of the son, Mr. Shepard, that when Mr. Shepard caught wind of what Barry Capello had said in that trial, they called him a rat said that he was dead to that family, and you heard in that FBI report that ratting out a mob, that is a punishable offense by death. So Mr. Shepard, the defendant, was just waiting to exact that revenge. But we also heard about the car that places the defendant at the scene of the crime in that very specific dark green Ferrari. That an eyewitness could see the color killer run into that same Ferrari the getaway car at the scene of the crime at the time of the crime. Members of the jury, we know about those jumper games. Because today we heard from a marshal that these were concluded to be the murder weapon. That these are the exact same make and color of jumper cables that the rental company that the defendant used put in their cars. And that after Augie Shepard rented that car, these jumper cables mysteriously went missing from the vehicle. The case, the car, the cables. Members of the jury, we came today with two charges against the defendant, and it's true we have to prove them beyond a reasonable doubt. We have to prove to you that Barry Capello was intentionally murdered by Augie Shepard. We have to prove that he did so in retaliation against witness testimony. Today, members of the jury, we've met that part. We've shown you that the defendant left his hotel room, that he has no alibi between the times that Barry Capello would have been murdered, that his car was spotted at the murder scene. Not an eyewitness described the killer with the exact same descriptions that fit Augie Shepard. Members of the jury, the case, the car, and the cables tell the whole story, but I want to focus a little bit on the story the defense told. Because what did they actually tell you? Well, they pointed out that there's minimal forensic evidence as to who killed Barry Capel. Members of the jury, we know from that eyewitness that the killer was seen wearing gloves. That's exactly why there's no DNA or fingerprints on the body or those jumper cables. Remember, there's testimony that this guy was a mob boss for six years. He knows how to cover himself up. 
they also stepped into the well and, and did a demonstration of that, how the murder must have occurred. It was the jury remember that Augie Shepherd is 5'11", 190 pounds. He's a bigger guy. He was a strong guy. Who could have just taken a step back from the, the victim, kept his DNA off the victim, covered himself up? The forensic evidence, it, it doesn't hurt our point. But you also heard today no explanation from the defense of who else would have hurt Barry Capel. We know that he lived in Santa Monica. I live in Los Angeles, I'm sure most of you do. We know that Santa Monica is not a crime-ridden area. They gave no other explanation of who might have wanted to hurt Barry Capello, who might have wanted to lure him out of his house and strangle him. That was the jury, the only explanation for why such a tragedy occurred on such a specific night, June 25th, 2021, the night Augie Shepherd arrived in Los Angeles, is that this murder was perpetrated by Augie Shepherd himself. The only person on the record who had a bone to pick with Barry Capella. The only person with the means, motive, and opportunity to commit this crime the jumper cables, the green sports car, the description, all of the evidence points to one person and one person alone. Augie Shep. So members of the jury, when you return to that deliberation room, I want you to remember those three things. The case Barry Capello testified in again the car that the defendant was driving, and the car that the killer got into to flee the crime. And finally, the jumper cables that perfectly match the ones missing from the defendant's rental car. If you remember those three things, we know that you'll find the justice <coughs> that this verdict requires. I'll ask you to find Augie Shepard guilty of murder, and retaliation against a witness. Thank you. Close your honor. First, would it be all right if Ms. DeLacy just repositioned herself for time being purposes? Uh, sure. You may. Your Honor, Ms. Scanlon, members of the jury. Ms. Scanlon just got up here and she told you that the case, the car, and the cables, they all tell you that Mr. Shepard is guilty. Funny that their own investigator testified herself on cross-examination today. I didn't find a shred of evidence linking Mr. Shepard to the crime scene. Members of the jury, nothing tells you more clearly than the words of their own witness, that the government, the police, their own investigator, cut corners to make their case. That's a problem for the government today. Because today they charged Mr. Shepard with two very serious crimes, murder and eyewitness retaliation. Members of the jury, that's important to know today. Because when Mr. Shepard came to his trial, he was presumed to be innocent. And he stays innocent. Unless the government can prove that he killed Mr. Capella because of that trial three years ago beyond a reasonable doubt. The highest burden in our legal system. So members of the jury, if you still have questions about the government's case, if you think that there's some facts that they ignore. If you think that they cut corners to make their case, then you cannot find Mr. Shepard guilty, and members of the jury were confident that you won't. But before you deliberate, I want you to think about those three questions that I asked you about at the very beginning of this trial. 
How much evidence does the government actually have? Does their story really make any sense? And why are they accusing Mr. Shepard in the first place? Let's go ahead and take those one by one. First, how much evidence does the government really have? Because members of the jury today, we heard about a very violent struggle outside Mr. Capello's home. We heard that Mr. Capello was attacked with these jumper cables. They were pulled around his neck so hard that he couldn't breathe. Their own witness told you. Someone in that position would try to save their life. They would struggle. But members of the jury, what did we hear today? We certainly didn't hear about any bruises on Mr. Shepard's body. Didn't hear about any cuts, no scratches. Members of the jury, we didn't, we didn't even hear about him leaving skin cells, hair follicles, fingerprints at the scene of the crime, unless he was wearing a full body snow, so he would have left something behind. But instead, the government can't give you a single piece of forensic evidence that actually puts him at the scene of the murder. So let's talk about that second question. Does their story really make any sense? Because members of the jury today, we heard a lot about GPS data. You don't need me to tell you that a lot of us have one of these. And the information that these phones can tell us, it's pretty useful. We heard that's exactly why the police tracked Mr. Shepard's phone. And members of the jury, what did they learn after they did that? They learned that he was miles away from the scene of the murder at his hotel from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. the entire night. But even if you believe Ms. Scanlon, even if you think that somehow in the middle of all that, Mr. Shepard escaped and murdered Mr. Capello, ask yourselves just one very simple question. If that's really true, how in the world did Mr. Shepard know how to find Mr. Capello in the first place? Members of the jury today, we heard. Mr. Capello was in witness protection. It's not like you could find his address in the yellow pages. It's not like you could look him up in the internet. And the members of the jury, what does the government think happened here? That Mr. Shepard pulled out a laptop, typed in Barry Capello address on Google, and then drove to his house? Members of the jury, that doesn't make sense. And that brings us to that third question. Why is the government accusing Mr. Shepard in the first place? Members of the jury, we heard that the answer to that question is pretty simple. Years ago, Mr. Capello named Mr. Shepard as the leader of a crime ring in open court. And so members of the jury, what happened next? It makes a lot of sense. We heard that the police, the government, they went with the only name that they had. They pointed the finger right back at Mr. Shepard. They cut corners to make their case against him. Members of the jury, that's so important to remember today. I want you to think about why we're really here. Think about how much evidence you really heard. Members of the jury, Mr. Shepard, he's a father. He has a son. This is someone who went to Los Angeles for a college trip, and he came back being accused of a criminal because the government cut corners to make him. Don't make the same mistake. I am not guilty. Thank you. Rebuttal, One person fits the killer's description. One person had the killer's car, and one person was in possession of these cables. Fine doggy shepherd, guilty. 